You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Randy. India Paper Money Madness, Massive Backdoor in Android Devices, Ethereum Fork Number 4 is Primed, and Fake News Foils Google. All this and more on episode 182, here on Wednesday, November 16th, 2016. JJ, in the traditional markets this week, we have gold dropping to $1,225. Silver drops to $16.96. Oil, for one barrel, it's uh, $45.33. The Dow Jones is trading around $18,868. And the 30-year Treasury yield, yield climbs to... 2.915%. 2.915%. The euro is down slightly at $1.07, and one US dollar and seven cents, and the yuan is trading uh, pretty steady still. It's pretty steady around 15 cents, US cents, and the British pound is trading at $1.24. Thanks, Darren. In the Bitcoin markets, it's up this week to $740. Litecoin is up slightly to $3.84. Zcash is uh, well, I mean, it's not. We haven't tracked it yet, but we're going to start tracking it. It's at ninety eight dollars and fifty cents, and the high. If you look at the chart, it's just staggering. So, just take a look for once. But it's and down to ninety eight dollars and fifty cents. Down. Um, the dash dash is down to nine dollars and eleven cents. Ethereum is down to ten dollars and seven cents. Monero is up to six dollars and forty five cents. The Argor Rep token is stable at four dollars and forty eight cents. And Darren, what is what is Doge doing these uh, days? One Doge is currently trading at one Doge. JJ, excellent. Wow, such stable, such stable. Well, just a reminder: you can tune into NeoCash Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome NeoCash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Wow. Excellent. Well, Darren joining us in studio. You've had a, a busy season this election season. Of course, we talked about it in the election in last week's episode yep, when yep. Jeremy was on. Yep. And, and it went extra long. Please check it out if you want to hear what Jeremy has to say at the very end of the episode. But anyway, Darren, what's going on with you? Well, I, I uh, threw my hat in the ring and I ran for uh, the, the state house here in New Hampshire uh, in my district. And uh, it was a spirited election season i would say yes very. Uh, certainly at the federal level it was uh, it was kind of spirited it's, it's funny because i try to ignore federal politics bec- uh, just for my own uh, smart my own uh, sanity maybe <laughs> yeah basically and uh so uh it was funny when i was running people were asking me uh about what i thought about the federal uh campaign but i, I had some really good ideas i felt for the state house here locally and uh so I, I tried. I, I ran as a Republican since I've been a Republican since 17. And um, there was one fella that I liked running with, uh, Brian Seaworth, and, and the, the other Republican on the slate. I, I didn't get to meet. I uh, didn't really meet him. Uh, but uh, it, it was a fun campaign. So uh, Brian got reelected, and I did not get reelected. But uh, it was interesting. Uh, my district's two towns, and the t- the uh, three people who won are all from the other town, and also the three people who won are incumbents. Okay. So, uh, so I, I'm pretty uh, encouraged because I actually beat out the town moderator of my town. Um. So, uh, so it wasn't like a complete, uh, complete. Uh, I mean, it was very tight race. Uh, this local race that I was involved in. And uh, I learned a lot, and I'm very glad I had that. And actually, I'm kind of relieved because I've been putting off some things that I want to do because I assumed that I would need to save that time for the state house. And so now that that time is freed up, it's like, oh, I'm going to teach a class. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So uh, there's no shortage of uh, fun things to do here in New Hampshire. Right. And uh, and I'm going to try... My best as a civilian to uh, influence those people up in Concord. We did miss having you here, Darren. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, yeah. So we, I missed one, uh, one Neil Cash Radio. Uh, basically, I went to a training so I could learn how to advertise more effectively. And I also, I'm the next last one I missed that was kind of me moping. <laughs> a little bit. It's okay, Darren. Uh, <laughs> we had it covered, and uh, there's there's so much to talk about. I'm glad that, that you're back on the show today with us. Yes. 
And let's get right to the news because there's a lot of big stories here, Darren and uh, Randy. So India in the scuffling. Yeah. So last week we talked a little bit about it. Jeremy had brought it up. Actually, I hadn't heard about it yet, but uh, the, the prime minister of India made a surprise announcement last week that they were going to be phasing out all of their 500 rupee and 1000 rupee notes uh, by the year's end. Um, they were, wow. yeah. So these are the largest denomination uh, bills they have. And they're the 500 rupee is about worth about $7 and 35 cents U S dollars. Uh, so the thousand rupee is, you know, right around 15 bucks. Um, those two notes alone represented 80 percent, about 86 percent of the country's currency. Uh, and the prime, the prime minister claims he wants to do this to curb tax evasion. It's estimated that about 3% of Indians file tax returns, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Um, but it's uh, it's a big cashless society. I'm sorry, it's a big cash based society. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people in India who don't have bank accounts. They they stick with cash. Uh, so to have this cash crunch all of a sudden was was quite a surprise indeed. What happened, um, as anyone might be able to guess, is calamity. People panicked and flooded uh, the banks. The they they closed the banks the next day. Uh, to allow for the supply, right after the announcement, they closed the banks the next day so they could supply the banks with the new currency. Um, but by that was Wednesday. By Friday, uh, over half of the 202,000 ATMs in the country were still shut down, uh, and those that were functioning were mostly out of money. So there were all these scuffles and um, arguments and lines as people were waiting for hours and hours and hours to exchange their money. Um, police and paramilitary forces were called in in some places to, quote, keep order, um, as the banks struggle to keep up with the demand. So they were given two options. Uh, if Indian citizens were given two options, you can either de- deposit an unlimited amount of the old notes into a bank account by the end of the year. And you, they have some withdrawal limits. Uh, you could only get 10,000 rupees per day or, or 20,000 per week. If you don't want to open a bank account, so this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people, they want to know how much money everybody's got. Right. I guess the old bills were ripe for counterfeiting and they're quoted, they're saying that the, they were used for terrorist activities with counter, you know, sure, paying sure, Islamic militants with, yes. And so, um, but yeah, really what I'm seeing is they're trying to get everyone to open a bank account. So um, if you don't want to have the quote benefit of this unlimited amount of your money, uh, you can you can have one exchange of no more than 4,000 rupees before November 24th. So they announced this on the 8th, and they gave p- people a few weeks. Uh, and so you have one exchange of no more than 4,000 rupees, which is about $58, $59 US. So if you have any more than that in cash in those bills, it's going to become worthless in just a few weeks. Um, this was perhaps the most insulting out of all of this to me, is that airports, railway stations, hospitals, and fuel stations stopped accepting the old notes three days after the announcement was made. So if you got hurt within three days and you just, you know, whatever, were living or working and didn't have time to go wait for hours at the bank, you now have money that this hospital isn't going to take. And I've actually seen stories about that exact thing happening. So, yeah, and there's people pointing to the fact that this might be what's partly driving the gold price down so much. I mean, gold has been dropping quite a bit this year. Uh, India is one of the top world's top markets for physical gold. uh, And the prime minister was quoted as saying that there might be more measures coming uh, to, to curb this tax evasion and this uh, unsavory business. And so there's rumors that they might temporarily halt the gold, gold imports to combat conversions in of these cash stashes that they think are out there. Um, Earlier this year, they actually implemented a 1% uh, tax on excise tax on manufactured gold products that came into India. Uh, and a, so much it pissed a lot of people off so much so that a lot of the jewelers shut down their shops and went on protest for several weeks. Uh, imports this year on gold in India are already down 50% what they were last year around this time. Uh, the president of the India Bullion and Jewelers Association told the Wall Street Journal the entire trade has come to a halt. India seems to be moving toward a cashless society. Um, and they're coming up on the peak season for gold, which is the wedding season in India, and it goes from November 20th to December 14th. And so this whole cash crunch and people needing to change out their cash, it's really going to put a, a damper on it. So uh, gold gold and silver are going for quite a bit less than they were earlier well, this year. How is, how is Bitcoin doing there? Uh, it, the volume has seen a surge. Um, the CEO and founder of Crypto Compare told uh, CNBC that Bitcoin was trading at a $20 premium 
uh, in India at the beginning of September, so uh, about 3% more than it was going for here in the U.S., and now they're saying it's trading at about a $70 to $100 premium to the U.S. rate, so uh, we, we had it at 740 earlier. It was going around 810 820 uh, for trading out for rupees, so there is quite a bit of disparity there, but uh, yeah, more people wow, are looking so- for ways to keep their money theirs and imagine imagine that the problems is i mean it, the huge number of problems this comes from this but but what this really means is that if, if a government like if the united states all of a sudden said the 20 and the 50s and the hundreds are all you know they're all useless now you have yeah. to go exchange you have to do this thing like the same thing i That's mean the thing they did with gold back in the day right just imagine what that would mean for for everyday people like that have to, to interrupt their entire flow that have to figure out where the money is and figure out trading it out or you know like you said the banks ran out of money the hospitals didn't take the 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 old ones well i don't know how big their vending machine market is but think about all the bill acceptors that have to be traded out you know there's all every single vending machine that takes cash reads a certain format of a bill and these are all going to be different and they gave a very small window of time, so all these businesses are I'm going really to be su- reeling, trying to keep up. I'm really surprised there isn't even <laughs> open revolts against the government for doing this. Uh, but then again, you know, it's like, on one hand, you pretty much uh, dug yourself your own your grave, so to speak, by holding on to so many government notes. Yeah, and and uh, so if you're traveling there, if you happen to be in India right now and you got a bunch of rupees out from from an ATM or something, you're going to be spending them, you know, uh, over the course of your trip. You they gave you like a matter of ten days to be able to exchange up to five thousand rupees of that back. Is is what I, if I read that right? And so about seventy seventy five dollars, not a whole lot if you got got a bunch of money out for your trip. Um, so, but yeah, this is what you get when you've got a centrally controlled currency. It can someone can decree it worthless the very next day. Well, we've got some a, another story from uh, we're talking about China again, and China's been in the news a lot, and I expect they're going to be in the news. We a talked lot. about China a ton last week. Yes, we did. Uh, Shanghai AdUp's Technology Company Limited has firmware that secretly sends reports to Chinese servers. The AdUp's firmware is shipped with the mobile devices and is whitelisted by mobile antivirus tools as part of the system. The AdUp software is part of the firmware over-the-air update software system. According to the findings of security firm CryptoWire, the AdUp software could send encrypted messages to a company server in Shanghai that included precise details on how the phone is used, both chat logs, call logs, and location data. On top of that, the ad, add up software could install, uninstall, and update applications remotely via can, can, uh, commands issued from a second IP address found by CryptoWire. Wow. The add up software is used in a vast array of mobile devices across the world. Their website claims to have a 70% market share and 700 million active users. The device that was examined by CryptoWire was a blue. R1 HD, and the software is also found on many other popular and budget Android phones. The system applications are identified as com.adups.fota and com.adups.sysoper, both of which cannot be disabled or stopped. The Adups application sends reports on a regular schedule every 72 hours for text messages and call logs, and every 24 hours for the other personally identifiable information. So, Basically, what happened is CryptoWire found this, and they told the other people that sell Blue. Now, Blue is sold exclusively through Google, Amazon, and um, Blue, their their own sort of website thing. Okay. But this is affecting a lot of the budget phones, the phones that cost you almost nothing. Now, there are, there's a couple other stories about this, but it is really big news, and it was covered in the New York Times and, and a couple other places. The, the add-ups... Now, some of the, some of the uh, replies from the company, one of them has been, we're sorry about that. That was meant to be on the Chinese-only versions of the phones. <laughs> so, like, they wanted to mon- monitor people in China and they're, what they're doing and secretly send all this data back every 24 or 72 hours. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of the excuses. Sorry. R- wrong phones. <laughs> wrong firmware. <laughs> wow. Um, wrong country. Another one was that it was just shipped, um, it just just mistakenly shipped with it, like mistakenly shipped. Now, the phone that they talked about in this report, the CryptoWire report, uh, was was the BLU R1 HD. Now, the 
that that company claims that the the problem was only affecting 120,000 phones and they they have since been patched and fixed. But if if this company is saying they have 700 million active users, you know, they the 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 fact that this is happening in a in the US market where such a thing would draw a lot of problems and a lot of legal responsibility it's it's just like well i don't i don't know how much i can actually believe of of their excuses so i'm very skeptical about about this company and what they're doing but the fact that they have all this data sent back to their servers what is unknown and what what and the other stories have asked is who else has access to this? Who else are you sharing it with? And and they claim they're sharing it with no one. And in fact, in the case with this recent case with those tw- those 120,000 phones, they claim to have erased the data that they collected from those phones. So it, so it, there's that. I mean, there's some peace of mind there, right? Well, yeah. So no. <laughs> two two things. So I would want to know one simple, possibly simple answer is: is there any additional? manufacturing steps or costs involved in including this software and if so there's no way it was a mistake i think that's my easy way of finding out if it's at all any more expensive to have this little bit of software on there even a fraction of a cent oh no no it's the opposite i think that that they're selling because it's on a budget 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 phone the phone 50 buck 50 dollar phones for a smartphone that's that phone costs more than 50 bucks it's being it's being subsidized hmm to by, sell the data by yes by a snooping software i mean and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden all this data yeah G- guess what if if you don't know where the product is you are the product well and yet back to the point of we don't know what they're doing with this data or if they're selling it but also if anyone else is intercepting it i mean clearly if this was able to be discovered someone this appears to be someone white hat who discovered it who brought yeah. it to people's attention but this could have anyone could have been monitoring all this data and just like wow someone did the really hard work for me and compiled all this and i just have to listen into the feed this is great well, to be fair, CryptoWire, and to be fully honest, uh, CryptoWire is actually a startup. It was jump started by DARPA and the Homeland Security uh, folks. So it's definitely a government backed um, security company. Okay. So, so could there's also that. be a little pew pew lasers fired. Um, but yes, it's, that's a huge story. Uh, we're going to go on to another Chinese story here. U.S. Congressional Commission recommends blocking Chinese state-owned enterprises from buying U.S. companies. The U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission released its annual report, and the Chinese Communist Party is raising red flags. This year, Chinese state-owned businesses captured a record of $64.5 billion worth of acquisitions, according to Thomson Reuters data. The data shows massive outflows of Chinese capital across the world with twice the acquisitions as last year. The commission recommended that a statute be amended so that the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States could, quote, bar Chinese state-owned enterprises from acquiring or otherwise gaining effective control of U.S. companies, unquote. Given the campaign rhetoric from President-elect Donald Trump, the change could happen sooner than later. And the figure of that capital outflow is, is actually pretty drastic. Last year... Chinese uh, purchasing and acquisitions abroad by state-owned companies was only $100 billion. This year, it was $200 billion, with the U.S. being the biggest target. So as the Chinese yuan and Chinese housing bubble is about to burst, you have all these people smartly putting their money outside of China. But uh, let's talk about John McCaffrey on the smartphone to- topic once more. Yeah, so we went from China to China. Now we're going from smartphone to smartphone. This one uh, picking a little bit on iPhones, but I'm I'm sure he feels the same way about Androids. Uh, John uh, John McAfee, basically security expert, had some very terse words to say about people who handle their cryptocurrencies with their smartphones or spying devices, as he calls them. Uh, in London recently, doing an interview, uh, he was asked about uh, security uh, with cryptocurrency. He's actually taken some interest in Bitcoin, and I'll get to that in a minute. But he gestured at an iPhone on the table. And uh, warned the reporter, good God, this device was not designed to secure you and give you privacy. This device was designed to do the opposite, to open up where you are, who you are with, who your contacts are. This is a spying device. So uh, he basically pointed to something we've talked about a bit is that, uh, you know, you want to be safe with any currency that you are actually carrying around on your person, even if it's digital, if it's on one of your devices, uh, especially if you're using an app or something like that, that doesn't actually have the private, where you're not holding the private keys, you don't control the coins. Uh, and so, you know, he's 
he references people that he knows that he's talked to that have their entire um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin possibly on their phones, right? Uh, which he feels is quite stupid. And well, I'm, in I'm inclined light of to that, agree. That Android story we just talked about, right? Like, so th- there's no keylogger in this specific add up software, but because the software can't add and install and update software on its own through a remote command issued from a different Chinese server, it can install a keylogger. Yeah, and that is, you know what I'm saying. It's like it doesn't need one. It can install whatever it needs. Run it in the background. That's what. That's one of the things he talks about. Is uh, he said it. It would be, if, if security changes aren't made, he says it'll be absolute chaos, not because we don't understand it or we can't understand the math, but because there's no security whatsoever. So he's he's not attacking the Bitcoin protocol at all. It's simply that there's not sec- additional security on our devices, it, like where something like a keylogger could be absolutely used to circumvent uh, strong encryption easily. And he says, we're missing the trivial. We are all missing the trivial. Um, so I mentioned he'd taken some interest in Bitcoin recently. Uh, his company, MGT Capital Investments Incorporated, actually now operates a Bitcoin mining facility uh, up in Washington where it's nice and cool and he doesn't have to pay that much for, for cooling. Um, McAfee reports he's running 400 machines at about uh, five petahashes per second, and he plans to expand to approximately 2,000 machines by the beginning of next year. Uh, naturally, he has taken some security precautions to guard his facility uh, he, there's an anti-hacking machine that his company produces uh, called a Sentinel, which sits on the network and monitors all network traffic. It looks for any kind of anomalies, and uh, that's what he's using to secure his network. Wow. So, well, hey, you know, I, honestly, that's where things are coming to, where you have to have an active component protecting your system. It's no longer just passive protection and with passwords and encryption. And now with these sophisticated tools that are out there, you really have to have some sort of active protective layer, and uh, having a computer that does that is smart. But um, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, the, the fake news. What's the fake news, JJ? Well, the mainstream media? No, no, not the na- main, oh, although oh. although I could classify it as <laughs> fake, and in, in some sense, they do have a narrative. Uh, but no, fake news. So imagine you see a news story about how you know some candidate that you either like or don't like, it doesn't really matter. Some candidate has done something completely outlandish that that would totally make them look terrible in, in light of an election. Well, chances are it's probably a fake news story. I mean, unless they're talking about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> but, but fake news and viral video sites really know how to game the system, and Google is changing their AdSense policies to exclude the popular content. The recent election highlighted many things, including the role fictional media plays against the mainstream media machine. Unbound by talking points and political correctness, fake news sites devoured clicks and attention spans. Why is this a surprise? Modern politics is boring, flat platitudes, and emotionally charged drivel. Toss in an occasionally polarizing viewpoint, and you have the last two decades of presidential elections. From the Reuters article, quote, The shift comes from as Google, Facebook, and Twitter face a backlash over the role they played in the U.S. presidential elections by allowing the spread of false and often malicious information that might have swayed voters towards Republican candidate Donald Trump, unquote. This is only half the story. The other is the backlash from the perception that Google, Facebook, and Twitter did not do enough to help Clinton win. (laughs) And that's the truth. Where is that a quote from somewhere, JJ? Which which one? The uh, did not do enough to help Clinton win. No, no, no. That's my observation. Okay. okay. And and if you and if those listeners, we've covered uh, the media and their role in this past election for a few weeks now. But uh, this is the same backlash obvious pro Clinton networks like CNN, MSNBC, and NPR are facing. These networks were saying for months or even years that Hillary was president-elect, driving a narrative that it was inevitable, just like the war in Iraq. Facebook's statement, quote, We do not integrate or display ads in apps or sites containing, uh, containing content that is illegal, misleading, or deceptive, which includes fake news, unquote. <clears throat> which begs the question, what about WikiLeaks? The U.S. has declared the content illegal numerous times. Who determines what is admissible and what sort of appeal process is there? Is it really so hard to believe that people want to watch some funny fake news rather than the horrible reality of the past election cycle? Twitter is taking this to another level by suspending accounts of alternative right viewpoints. While some of the bans include truly hateful groups, Trump supporters are getting caught up in the purge. How is, is this how partisan social media platforms start? 
because I really hope it isn't. I really hope there isn't a liberal Twitter and a Republican Twitter and a liberal Facebook. And you know what? That sort of division. Oh, goodness. That's, that would be horrible. Division and echo chamber. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no dialogue. And so no one grows. No one, you know, no viewpoint is expressed and, and exchanged. Instead, everyone's just insular in their own little community. And anything that the other community says is just triggered, triggering for the, for the community that doesn't like that idea. Yeah, and there's no progress. Scapegoating. And, and this is, we talked to Roger Veer about this a little bit a couple weeks ago in a special interview uh, about Bitcoin Unlimited. Um, but there's still a lot of accusations of censorship going on with Reddit between the two uh, Bitcoin boards, uh, r slash Bitcoin and r slash BTC. Uh, r slash BTC claiming to be the one that is not engaging in censorship and accusing r Bitcoin of engaging in censorship. But, um, you know, it's unfortunate that the half of the front page of r slash btc is full of accusations of censorship and you really have to go start digging for news now instead of just poofling back and forth and i'm not saying that they shouldn't be voicing uh their opinions if they, if they feel that something terrible is going on I, i'm not saying that at all and clearly they're being upvoted so but it's just it's unfortunate and i think we could all agree on that that you know that it has to be filled with this drivel instead of actually advancing some kind of progress with the with the protocol. Would this apply to the Onion and um, yeah. websites? Onion that is are, a fake news site. Well, it's explicitly satire. Everybody knows it's satire. But the Onion still makes money off their AdSense. You know, they still okay. make a lot of these sites. Especially, mm. let's, here's the thing: like, imagine a smaller site getting started, and whether whether they're fake or real news depends on whether the person judging their site agrees with their viewpoints, right? I mean, in a way, that's really what it comes down to. And, well, let's uh, let's talk about the IRS, because that's another great topic that everyone <laughs> seems to enjoy. Yeah. Hooray. Um, so the U.S. Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, this is a, it's under the same umbrella, but it's allegedly an independent uh, audit of this IRS's practices, even though they both report to the U.S. Treasury. Uh, so this Inspector General for Tax Administration released a rather searing 31-page report uh, after a nine-month audit that explored the IRS's handling of virtual currencies like Bitcoin. Now, our favorite game, of course, what is Bitcoin? Is it money? Is it property? Is it... I see, one day we will have we will have a little little uh, game show bit <laughs> that we will do during <laughs> the da, show da, 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 for what da, is Bitcoin. Da, 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 da. What is Bitcoin? Edition number, and we'll, we'll just keep track of how many editions we've, we've done of this show, <laughs> yeah. right? So, like, d edition number 17, Randy, what is Bitcoin? Well, here at the federal level, uh, the IRS calls it property. It's not a currency, even though they repeatedly call it a virtual currency in their report, which, boy, that is so confusing. Uh, the report circles around how unclear the IRS's guidelines are and what a daunting user experience it creates for anyone who actually wishes to claim any debits or payments uh, that use Bitcoin. Uh, one of the major hurdles for compliance, for those who want to comply, is that the IRS wants a ridiculous amount of information for each and every virtual currency transaction. So if you used Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee every day, the IRS wants you to, derm to determine what portion of which Bitcoin was used to make each pur purchase based on a daily exchange rate. They want you to convert it into dollars, and then at reporting time, calculate whether or not there were any gains or losses from when you received the Bitcoin and from when you spent them. It doesn't really seem possible. Well, not only is it not... It, it, I, it could. If you, like, if you had nothing better to do in your life and you had a smartphone that you could have these complicated tables and all set up with time stamping and all that, you could probably do this. Well, and so but, because it's... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, but why? <laughs> <laughs> but why would you do this? Because they categorize it as property rather than a currency, uh, it, it, they claim it's subject to capital gains tax. So that's a big extra added step. And try to imagine if you had to keep a list of the serial numbers for all the dollar bills in your pocket and the day you received them and then you know go on some kind of exchange website and figure out whether those dollars were worth more or less when you got them versus when you spent them. Like That's what they're proposing. You know, I have an idea. Why? How about this? How about the taxpayer send the IRS a bill for the loss in value their dollars have had 
since they've had them in their bank account. Oh, and not to mention the time lost if you actually had to fill all this crap out. Like, how much is your time worth and how much time are you spending or paying someone else to spend going through all this stuff? Anyway. Wow. Uh, so representatives from the IRS agreed with much of the report's findings in an official response, uh, and they agreed to create a new virtual currency strategy coordinated across all IRS divisions b- by September 30th, 2017. Okay. Um, <laughs> they also uh, detail how questions from the public who were seeking guidance on how to comply often went unanswered. And they pointed out that most of the common, most common IRS tax forms like 1099s and the W-2 have no dedicated space for virtual currencies to be reported. Um, so the IRS reply on that one is that uh, changing those forms to, quote, capture virtual currency amounts is not a priority at this time, uh, end quote, citing tight funding. Right, of course. Yes. It's not a priority. Yeah. So, so don't, yeah. But well, here, here's how do you have tight takeaway. funding when you now, steal everything you have? I'm what? not a, a lawyer and I'm not a tax uh, person, whatever they're called, accountant. Accountant, yeah. But 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 it seems like they really don't care about Bitcoin. That's that's what I, my takeaway is. Well, moving on, we we've got one more story for you before we wrap it up. Ethereum update for fork number four is released. That's right. The second half of a fix started months ago. The Ethereum Foundation released version 1.5, and according to the post at GitHub titled "Quote Let There Be Light," it contains quote about eight months of work and many new features and fixes, fixes, unquote. The code will trigger on block number 2,675,000 sometime next Tuesday. The fork contains replay protection, state clearing, and code size limit. Other notable points include a restructuring of the blockchain database, Go API, iOS, and Android support, and some highly experimental features. Coming early next year, the Ethereum name service will be launching, and this will allow users to register a name to link to their various Ethereum dApps and functions. The name would be used in place of the ubiquitous random character string that is used in all cryptocurrencies. Wow. So this makes like a human readable address versus a hex code. That's right. The name would look like a website with a top-level domain of .eth. An example would be neocache.s or donate.neocache.s. Uh, quote, registration does not guarantee perpetual ownership, unquote, the blog states, indicating that a value to secure a name may go up in the future. The registration pro- process features an auction where the winner places the amount in a deed for it uh, f- and this lasts for a year, after which either a price adjustment or another auction would occur. A dispute resolution is also in the works. It's very early in development and the blog post is soliciting feedback. So, this sounds like a solution that we the the previous one the previous story we talked about where your serial numbers, <laughs> but also just making it a lot easier to relay information and having this sort of name format, I think would make cryptocurrencies a lot more easier and more mainstream. I mm-hmm. think this is a huge step towards making crypto mainstream. Is if you can make it look like the web and you can make it look like something someone else has already used then they're sort of already familiar with your product, right? Well, we talked about that a little bit with uh, Jeremy last week with L- with Library, LBRY, the the way they're doing their their naming system and trying to, yeah, not just have it be a long URL with tons of address, with a huge address like a BitTorrent file or something like that, but something very recognizable and easy to right. secure and rem- remember. Yeah, I, I think it's smart. And the fact that they're not perpetually, they're not planning on per- perpetual ownership, like you can't just buy a name forever, the fact that it is a free market-based solution of auction, and the fact that you don't actually pay someone for the name, but in fact you get that money back after you are no longer registered for you, that you name. You basically put up a bond for the name Exactly. Or a yeah. deed. They call it a deed. A deed, okay. Right. But, okay. So I think all of that is good, good news and, and good direction. I'm really looking forward to see how it works out. So we got one more quick note. Yeah, I just wanted to, we talk a lot about uh, money and things like that. And uh, I just wanted to give a little shout out to a local charity here in New Hampshire called Shire Sharing that a friend of ours runs, Amanda Bolden. <laughs> uh, it's it's a great Thanksgiving charity that uh, tries to raise money to donate uh, meals to families in need at Thanksgiving. And uh, I made a little donation myself and I'm going to be helping out this weekend to assemble meals. And if anyone's interested in learning more and might want to help out, they're trying to uh, feed 500 families this year, and you can visit shiresharing.org. And, uh, yeah. 
All right. Uh, well, you can also donate to Neocash Radio. Now, we often <laughs> almost true. never ask for donations. And so if you want to bring up Shire Sharing, I'm going to say you can donate to Neocash Radio at our blog. We'd really appreciate all of that. <laughs> Neocashradio.com. And, and, yeah. if, and if you're not listening to this podcast timely, n- n- Shire Sharing is a Thanksgiving uh, donation. It's, it's, uh, yes. So. And they do accept timely, Bitcoin. Very quick yeah, thing. And they do accept Bitcoin. And so if you're listening to this on Wednesday, uh, go ahead and get your donation in there. If yeah, because it's coming up very, very, th- very, very, th- very soon to the end, and in fact, yeah, you should like, really check to see if yeah, the- Saturday Randy's gonna get all the bags together. Sunday I'm gonna deliver them, and cool. Then it's over. All right, so you can check out our podcast every Wednesday. We are on all kinds of places like uh, podcast that is Stitcher, iTunes, I Google Radio. Play, and all that. So this is JJ, Darren, and Randy for Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.